Uh, welcome. Uh, we have Professor Jadwiga Biskupska with us. Uh, we're here at the Orchard Lake campus uh, at the Polish Institute of Culture and Research on Orchard Lake. And uh, this evening we had Dr. Jadwiga Biskupska speak uh, on her new book, uh, Survivors, Warsaw Under the Nazi Occupation. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased to have her here. Hello, Dr. Biskupska. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here tonight to talk about Polish history. Uh, this is a book, I wrote a book about Polish history about Poles under Nazi occupation. Um, but I often spend my time talking more broadly about the Second World War, about Nazi Germany, and about the Holocaust. So it's really valuable to be able to talk about this in the context of, of Polish history, of, of, of Polish Catholic history, which is very important in, in Warsaw. Um, so how did this book come about? Where did this project come from? Um, it took a long time to write this book. And <laughs> uh, you, you laugh. Um, it always takes longer than, than someone thinks. Mm -hmm. This started out many years ago as a PhD dissertation. Um, and I think after hmm, 10 or 15 years, I answered all of the questions I asked as a PhD student, but it took a long time. So this is a book that was intended to answer the question I had. It was very a naive question, which is what did the Warsaw intelligentsia who were targeted by Nazi Germany as, as elites who might drive the Polish national project and who might foment a possible independent Polish state, which Nazi Germany didn't want during the Second World War. What did they do under Nazi occupation? Um, what were they able to accomplish? What did they think was possible? Um, how did that relate to earlier periods in Polish history? How did it intertwine with the Holocaust of Poland's Jews? Who were these people who were you know, nation builders in, in Poland? Um, and how could I present that to, to an American audience, to English speakers, to people who knew things about the Second World War, who knew about D-Day and, and Rommel and Hitler and you know, Auschwitz, but not the particularities, the ins and outs of Polish history, which are not well known outside of, outside of Poland and outside of you know, the Polish diaspora, like the Polonia. Um, and that was, that was what I set out to do, and I think I accomplished some of that I learned. I learned some things in the process. Um, uh, I got to go to some fantastic places and spend some time in Warsaw and many other archives. Um, uh, and I think I came to some conclusions about about what Warsaw was like under Nazi occupation. But I'm sure that ten years from now I'll have I'll have more material. I'll think I'll think different things then as well. Great, thank you. And I'm wondering, uh, because a lot of people will have, as you mentioned, a lot of Americans have mm -hmm. at least heard about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. they, may not, they may not know, uh, you know everything that, uh, that uh, we, we want them, as, as teachers would want them to know. Uh, but how does this fit with the Holocaust? Is, mm -hmm. this, is this a Holocaust? When you talk about the Warsaw intelligence, is this a, a Holocaust story? Mm -hmm. Is it separate from the Holocaust? Is it, um, you know, can, can it be, is it subsumed under the Holocaust? How does, how does it relate to, uh, to that larger topic that, that a lot of Americans may, may have heard about? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's especially a great question now because all of the data we have recently, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum comes out with these surveys every year that says young Americans, the people the age of our students, don't know very much about the Holocaust. There's a general sense that it's it's understood, but when whenever that's broken down and people are actually asked to give information, they don't understand it. And I think that it's timely, it's important, it's enduringly important for Americans, for Westerners, um, to understand what Nazi Germany did. Um, and one of the central and most enduringly important things it did is it attempted to murder all of the Jews of Europe. And, or all of the Jews under, under Hitler's control, which, which also included some North African Jews and, and others. And where does Poland fit into that story? Well, that's, that's actually pretty obvious. And that is that, that Poland was home to the largest Jewish community on earth. Nearly, nearly three million Polish citizens in the Polish Second Republic were Jewish. Um, Polish Jews were an extraordinarily dynamic and important part of, of Polish national and cultural life, though a contested and complex mm -hmm. one. The average Pole um, through the Second World War was in fact a Roman Catholic rather than Jewish. So the story of the Holocaust intertwines with the history of Nazi German occupation of Poland and what happens to Polish Jews and to European Jews more broadly becomes an intertwined and complex chapter of what happened to Poles. 
and that's really important, but it's also, it's also a very difficult thing for both of those communities to process. Holocaust survivors, um, remnants of the, of the Jewish community that end up in all sorts of places, including, crucially, the, the United States and Israel and other places, um, Poles who survived the war, and, and indeed we can speak of Poles surviving the war, as I emphasize in my book, because the Nazi occupation of Poland is, is so brutal, we, we have to speak of, of a question of survival. Um, and so these things intertwine themselves in that Catholic Poles, non-Jewish Poles, become both victims of Nazi Germany in some of its in its early campaigns. And I write specifically about the, the intelligentsia in Warsaw, this, this cadre of national, cultural, political leaders, most of whom are not Jewish, but some of whom are. So assimilated Polish Jews would, would be in this in this category. And they become victims of some of Nazi Germany's persecutions. They lose their independent state. Um, they are conscripted for labor by Nazi Germany. They're mistreated. They're subject to all sorts of brutal regulations. And then they become unwittingly some of the key observers, witnesses, of the developing and intense anti-Semitic persecutions that become murderous and that we know collectively as, as the Holocaust. So in Warsaw, the city that's the subject of my book, it's the capital of Poland. It's also the most important community of, the largest community of Polish Jews. It's the seat of um, all sorts of things in Poland and it's, it's a central node of Polish Jewish life. So one of the things we might understand about Poland under Nazi occupation during the war is it's a place where many persecutions are intertwined, where many people are targeted and killed by numbers, the, the, mm -hmm. Polish, the Polish Jewish community is, is the central victim group there, but that should point towards the fact that in Poland, experience was brutal and complicated and fractious, and the memory of the war therefore is inflected through people's mm -hmm. particular identities. Were you Jewish, right? That means a very particular fate. Were you a Catholic priest? Very different fate. Are you a peasant? Are you a child? Right? Are you elderly? So this experience is extraordinarily fraught. It's complicated. It's hard to simplify. And with time and with great distance from, from Poland, right? We're, we're in Michigan here. Mm -hmm. That's very far from Warsaw emotionally, right? Geographically, is that the temptation is to try to simplify that story. And this is a very hard story to simplify. Um, and speaking of that, uh, when we, we talk about the group that you're most interested in in this book, the Warsaw Intelligentsia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you use, uh, you also you have used the term elites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Americans understand elites, when, when the Americans hear the word elite, um, they, they think of maybe the one percenters. Um, <laughs> but you're talking about a, a, a different group, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a broad group. It's not necessarily even an economic group. Mm -hmm. Class. I mean, it, it may there may be you know some that are better off than others, uh, and you know certainly as far as the Germans were concerned, this could be school teachers. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, you know uh, someone who is a very successful businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who was ed who had some education. Um, can you talk more about kind of define this group and, and sort of what? Uh, you know, what for, for an American audience, what um, w what was this group? Who were they, um, and how and how did they collectively form uh, have an identity as as intelligentsia? Mm -hmm. So that's it's one of the things we're we're taught to do, and people need to do if they mm -hmm. want to make sense. Is you have to define your terms. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm using this word intelligentsia, but that, that word doesn't really work in English. Mm -hmm. and we don't have a direct sy right. uh, synonym. Uh, elite is the temptation, but we, most people use that word now. They don't mean it positively. Mm -hmm. yeah. One percenters. Yeah. I'm not talking about, about one percenters in Warsaw under Nazi occupation. Um, the word intelligentsia, the, this comes to us from the Russian tradition. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a weird word because these are weird histories. Um, at least to us, the, the, <laughs> in the well, West. To Americans, yeah. yeah. To Americans, to Westerners. Um, and now, of course, America has a weird history. I mean, to say that it's, it's American. All, all histories may be um, weird, yeah. Yeah, is that if you look at them in the right way, they're all, they're all really weird. Um, but Polish history, I think, among European states, upon European nation states, has this very tortured history that marks um, Poles, that marks the Polish landscape. And the word intelligentsia sits at the center of that. So if you can explain who these people are, you can explain a lot of the reasons that Polishness is odd because there's essential kind of weird algebra to modern Polish history. And that is that 
in the modern world, say since since the French Revolution, right, in 1789 until you know now, um, most of the time there hasn't been a sovereign Polish state, and yet in East Central Europe in much of the Western world, there's been a recognition that there is something called Poland and there are people called Poles. So the big question in Polish history, which is not to say the big question for Poles now who have plenty of their own concerns, but I think the big interesting question at the heart of Polish history is how do we explain the fact that there are people called Poles, that there is something coherent to be meant by terms like Polish culture, and yet there's not necessarily a container of statehood for that. So uh, Poles are a people who have a once in future state in many, in many moments. And during Nazi occupation, arguably they don't have a state. They don't have a functioning state. There's a government in exile in, in France and then in London, but Poles aren't being governed in a day-to-day -day sense uh, under, under Nazi occupation during the Second World War in any sense that you and I would, would take for granted. Um, so who are the intelligentsia? Let me double back to that. Is When I use the term intelligentsia, I mean a group of people, self-conscious actors, who think of themselves as Polish. By and large, they speak and write in Polish, though many of them are multilingual. And who are these people functionally speaking? Well, they're the people who considered themselves Polish even at times when that was not an advantageous thing to be. And the crucial moment for that are, are, are the partitions of the, of the majority of the 19th century up until the founding of an independent Polish state after World War I beginning uh, in 1918. So the intelligentsia are essentially the community of people who still believe in an idea of Poland and who sustain Polish culture and Polish letters and they do so under uh, systems of occupation, of, of imperialism, um, under Russian and Prussian, later German uh, uh, partition, under Austrian partition. So they keep, we might say, keep Polish culture alive. And it's easy to say that in a sort of an optimistic idiom, but I'll note here that this is not a consensus group. This is not people who all have one political program or are moving in lockstep. These are people who are reading Mickiewicz to their children, but they're also people who are fighting amongst themselves about what it means to be Polish, you know, what the future should be like. They're, they're keeping a, we might call it a national conversation alive in the Polish language. Now, why do they matter in 1939? Well, because for 20 years, these people had sort of normalized into a state, right? They'd become bureaucrats and doctors and lawyers and college professors and priests, and you know, they'd raise their children um, because Poland had become normal in the state sense. It had acquired an independent state. So the importance of the intelligentsia in the interwar period could be debated, though those are pretty key people to profit um, culture and society. But suddenly in 1939, when Nazi Germany invades, Poland again doesn't have a functional state. So this intelligentsia mission revives. A group of people, especially in Warsaw, start figuring out what to do under the horrible circumstances of occupation. And the people who still think, well, if things go well or they don't just go comprehensively badly, we might be able to resurrect some sort of independent state. Those people are functionally the intelligentsia under these circumstances, and they very self-consciously see themselves as the inheritors of this partition tradition, that they look back to traditions of 19th century uprising or of positivism and other things. They see themselves as carrying on in that tradition. They're the continuers of, of a Polish national project. But I'll note here again that they're not in agreement about what's going on. Precisely one of the things I trace in my book is they had ferocious disagreements about short-term and long-term priorities, violence, violent rejection of Nazi occupation, um, should there be violence, when should there be violence, allied with whom, um, was violence pointless, what to do about the developing Holocaust, you know, questions of Polish Jews, where do they fit into Polish society, other things that I spent a lot of time researching this is what to do about young people how to you know, inculcate them into this mission, and that became therefore a project of education, which, which I would argue is one of the great successes of the Warsaw Intelligentsia, is they educate a new generation of young people in Polish to read Polish literature and know Polish history, but also to do things like study geometry in the classics. They, they raise a new tradition 
of educated, self-conscious people despite the incredibly difficult circumstances of occupation. So that's, that's who these people are. And then, of course, why are they important to Poland? Because the main continuity in modern Polish history is that statehood, sovereign statehood, has not been the norm. Great, thank you. And and I'm wondering about that question of education because it's something you, you I know you've touched on you touched, mm -hmm. touched on quite a bit in the book and in, in the talk you gave uh, here this evening. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about what that education mm -hmm. project? You characterized that as one of the one of the successes. A lot mm -hmm. of uh, you know the, the the discourse I suppose about the occupation in Warsaw is the destruction of the city, the destruction right. mm -hmm. of the. Uh, of the of a lot of the population, uh, Jewish primarily, but also non-Jewish uh, displacement of mm -hmm. the population. But you mentioned this as a success. How mm -hmm. was it a success, and what what were some of the the mechanisms that uh, mm -hmm. made it successful? Yeah, I, it's, uh, one of the things that was obvious to me when I started started this project is is one of the things that had been written on most extensively was on the mature Polish paramilitary and military resistance. And the main institution of that is, is the Home Army, or Armia Krajowa. And that has extensive documentation. It's enormously important, especially in 1944, but also in the year previous. Um, and I think that is important, but it's, it's also well studied. And it struck me that the Warsaw Intelligentsia had to be taken more seriously, especially in, in years before that. Yes, some of them fight. Yes, some of them eventually contest Nazi occupation with force. But if we think about what the intelligentsia is, is this group of people who are carrying on Polish national traditions, well, violence and soldiering aren't necessarily going to be the obvious thing for them to take up. Um, that seemed pretty clear to me, and it was also very clear to the intelligentsia themselves. So one of the earliest oppositions, so opposition movements or organizations under occupation, is in, almost immediately after Nazi Germany invades and, and Warsaw is, is, is conquered after a long siege, is that university professors and teachers start reorganizing their, their classes. And they do so for very practical reasons. So Nazi Germany invades in fall of 1939 when an academic semester is beginning. And many young people, university students who lived around Warsaw, had come to the capital and were interrupted by this invasion. And their professors and reconstituted schools because wh why wouldn't they? I think of you know, C.S. Lewis's famous exhortations in, in, at the beginning of the Second World War. You know, we do the project of education now, or you know, there's never going to be a perfect time. Um, and they began to do this. But the interesting thing about that is almost immediately the Civilian Occupation Administration of Poland made higher education illegal. So this wasn't simply something people continued because they thought it was important. It immediately put them outside the law of occupation. And Nazi Germany did this because they saw themselves as occupying Polish territory in the long term. We use the Nazi phrase here is, is they wanted Polish territory for the edge of, of Lebensraum for long-term German settlement. And they thought that a Polish leadership class, which they understood much like the Poles understood their own intelligentsia, though Nazi Germany was against the idea, um, that these people would be key sources of rebellion, which it turned out was correct. Um, and therefore, they didn't want this class to be able to operate, and they didn't want it to be replaced. So they didn't want people to be educated in Polish as self-conscious Poles. So university education, forbidden. Um, elite high schools that will train people to, you know, take a matura or, or finishing exam, forbidden. Seminaries and, you know, academies of various sorts, fine arts academies, all that's forbidden. So one of the things that the Warsaw Professoriate does, even in the fall of 1939, is it keeps teaching people anyway. And teaching, of course, changes. Um, resources are limited. It's very dangerous. Um, it's policed. People end up in Pavyak, the central political prison in Warsaw, they're executed and tortured um, simply for engaging in university education. But there's huge numbers of people who want to study who continue this, this project um, at the university level. We have detailed records of the University of Warsaw operating underground um, in various faculties. Uh, and it's fascinating, the documentation is fascinating, what people studied, who was teaching them. Um, one of the things that happened over the course of the occupation is the student body became increasingly female. 
right? except in you know, theology um, and seminary studies, but even the hard sciences were increasingly the domain of women. Why? Uh, well, because young men increasingly turn to paramilitary and military resistance. Um, but, but education under occupation is a fascinating story of a society trying to survive, to think about the future, and also for people to occupy their children and teenagers. And that became educating them in huge numbers of people who we wouldn't think of as resistors became involved in this project because they were intellectuals, because they were teachers, because for a thousand reasons. But the result was is that in occupied Warsaw and in other places in Poland, you could actually get a formidable education in the classics, in the arts, in the humanities. Lab, Lab sciences were a bit different. different. Um, um, and, and we, we know, know based, based on, on the wartime, wartime high school, school finishing, finishing examinations, examinations and the later careers of some of the people educated this way, that significant intellectuals and artists and thinkers were trained. And we might even think that in some ways that their education was more important to them because of the circumstances under which, under which they studied. And I think by my own sort of modest measures and also by, by the assessment of the people involved, by these, these intelligentsia figures, the underground educational system at the high school and university level was a stunning success. Which doesn't mean it didn't take casualties, but its, it's overall results during the war and thereafter, I think, demonstrate that this was a successful and vibrant way to educate young people. Was there an ethical and moral component to this? One of the things that, that I, I um, have talked about with my students is this notion of educating for a future Poland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and sort of what sort of Poland is it going to be? Um, and, and if we have young people shooting, you know, they're going out and killing other people, mm -hmm. which maybe they have to do, do we limit that? Um, you know, is it, the, the, the very often in underground organizations they would limit the number of uh, assassinations that you could participate in because they were concerned about um, the, the, you know, what's going to happen after the war. Are we going to create a, a nation of killers? Uh, in a sense, um, mm -hmm. and, and so what, there, there had to have been a, a moral and ethical side to this education as well. So there's a lot of thinking that appears in the periodical literature in Warsaw Underground and in people's diaries about sort of what 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 happens after this. Um, and there's not a consensus, but there is there's there are a lot of people raising that question in different ways, and priests and catechists and parents is the obvious one. Um, and there's no one answer, and young people themselves, who are the people being worried about, have a million different answers to these questions. And there are people who are devoutly religious teenagers and things who swear off alcohol and cigarettes and things. Um, uh, and then there are others who are kind of go wild under, under occupation. But I think maybe the most concrete way we could answer that question is in some of the sort of courses of study or syllabi of the underground high schools. I mean, universities are a bit different. Their goal was to, their goal was to continue as much of pre-war education as was possible in limited circumstances, in seminar style, obviously, you no know, big lecture halls. Um, those are occupied by the Wehrmacht, by and large, in, in Warsaw. But in high schools, I have and I found in the course of my research the basically school planning materials of a few underground schools, right? Um, and there were schools operating above ground that were allowed by the Nazi occupation, but those were by and large supposed to be vocational schools. They weren't supposed to teach a humanities curriculum, this ethical curriculum. Um, and some of those were supplemented sort of on the sly, right? Boys would learn agricultural sciences, but they'd also be taught you know, Catholic religious you know, catechesis. Um, that was illegal, but they were. Um, but I went through a number of, of school books of several underground schools, and it's fascinating what they, what they prioritized. Um, the goal was to give as broad an education to these young people as possible. And some things might surprise you. For instance, many of the children were learning things like Latin, you might not think that's practical, but who knows? Many of them were learning German, and we could think about why that's true. Um, but there was a strong emphasis on Polish literature, Polish history. Um, that probably doesn't, doesn't surprise us. Um, and there was a strong emphasis on consistency of student behavior. Are they tardy? Are they turning in their assignments? We can think about character formation there. Um, one document I, I, I ran across from one of these underground boys' schools is that the last semesters as the Warsaw Uprising breaks out, we lose records, right? The school ceases to function. And there's, um, there's a survey taken after the war of the boys who, who survive in their families. Um, 
And it's a questionnaire. I didn't get any of the responses. They don't show up in the archive, but it's a questionnaire about, you know, what did you study in school and what was your, what classes did you take and what was your address and how old were you and, you know, what is your career now? So how good was this education? And the last question is, well, what happened to you during the uprising? So this project breaks down because of the circumstances of the occupation, but there's every indication that the people teaching the young teenagers know themselves to be teaching not simply future professionals, doctors and lawyers, but they think of themselves as building a society that's in contrast to the way that Nazi German occupation is demeaning people. And that's very obvious that they're doing that, that ethics and catechesis and things are a huge part of what they're teaching. Now, is that a huge part of what the boys and girls remembered? That I don't have documentation on, but certainly from the educator perspective, that was the focus. Very good. Uh, and finally, just uh, we'll finish up with one last question: mm -hmm. the the fate of the intelligentsia uh, after the war. Um, was there was it the same war? So I mean, after the war, obviously Warsaw's uh, rebuilt. Uh, people, but some people are many people are killed. Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, many are sent into exile. Many don't long, no longer live in mm -hmm. Warsaw for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Is there still, um, after the war, uh, a, a Warsaw intelligentsia that reconstitutes mm -hmm. itself? And is it the same, or is it a, is it a new is it a new creature? So yes and no. I would say that one of the arguments about what happens in the immediate post-war in Poland is that the intelligentsia is fractured, that they that the occupation and the uprising in '44 and the ghetto uprising in '43, which destroys the young uh, Polish Jewish intelligentsia, is a body blow to this this intelligentsia project. But in the course of, of the existence of People's Poland, a, an intelligentsia is reconstituted. And we have a very good literature on that, how that's rebuilt and who, who rebuilds it. But we shouldn't be naive that between 1944 and 1945, a huge number of these people are killed or persecuted or scattered. Um, and in, in the conclusion of my book, I try to trace their individual fates. And I'll, I'll say a couple, it's hard to, to characterize because they're so different. And so what they do during the war, whether they engage in opposition or substantive resistance, hugely important in determining their fate. Um, I'll note first that there's big categories. One, if you're, if you're a Polish Jew, if you're in the Warsaw Ghetto or part of the Polish Jewish community, the likelihood you survive is, is very small. Okay? So there's, there's huge losses to the Polish Jewish community. But Poland's Jews are, are comprehensively wiped out. Warsaw's Jews are. A few people who show up in my book um, do survive to the end of the war. Yitzhak Tsukoman, for instance. So there's a few sort of precious survivors of that community. I'll also note the generation matters. By the end of the war, it's young people who are leading active, aggressive resistance. So there's a huge generational shift. And those who are still early in their lives, in their early 20s, when the war ends, they have very different decisions than their parents, their elders. Many of them try to make it in people's, people's Poland to sort of transition to this new state. Maybe it's not the state they wanted. Maybe it's exactly the state they wanted, but they're so young, they transition from independent Poland to occupation to, to early communist Poland. Older people don't necessarily. Um, some people are cast into a diaspora in which the rest of their lives, their, what they did during the war, defines them. So they become sort of professional resistors in retirement. Um, and others, I think a figure like, like um, Pilecki, because he's become very famous in Poland, in Poland today, who was persecuted by both the Nazi occupation and then by a later Soviet regime. So no matter one's politics or ideology or religion, one could end up a foul of one regime and a great friend of another, or you could actually end up a foul of both of, both of them. Um, which a number, a number of people did. Um, but one of the really interesting things I think about the decade after the end of the Second World War is if you're part of this group, if you're aspiring to a role in Polish national life, what you did during the war is absolutely vital to who you become. It's never neutral. And of course, this motivates a large number of people to embroider that story. <laughs> but there are plenty of people who don't have to, who did mm. Uh, lots of things during the war um, which become vital in, in uh, post-war Poland, um, regardless of its, of its politics. So they scatter enormously. And one of the things I detail in the book is, is many of the people whose, whose work I look at, whose lives I look at, do not survive until the end of the war. And yet there's still, I think, important echoes of their wartime projects in the later Polish states. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, the book is Survivors, Warsaw Under the Nazi Occupation.
Uh, it's coming out in paperback soon. Yeah. Um, and so I encourage you to, uh, to take a look. And thank you once again. Thank you, John.